Hi, uh, we will continue with our uh, anatomy classes, anatomy classes to understand the brain structure. I am um, emphasizing and spending a lot on lot, lot of time on this topic because uh, one it is as I told you difficult um, to, to understand especially for somebody not from a medical background uh, to have a uh, to know, know the technical nomenclature and be familiar. Uh, second thing is it is the starting point of uh, quite some of your work. Uh, many people would be foraying into various uh, areas of uh, neuroscientific uh, research and the analysis of the brain is uh, something which is core whether it be image processing, whether it be neural networks. So, uh, to be more familiar with topic I am using a strategy of I tried showing the 3D part of the story first because I, I feel that it is the 3D part which you need to understand. But having said that um, uh, the pace at which I would may have taught, uh, taught the uh, material may not be the most ideal and uh, may be difficult to comprehend also due to various uh, reasons you know um, camera my own kind of explanation may not be this one. So, uh, what I have uh, uh, thought about is to uh, to give you different uh, perspectives of the whole uh, perspectives of the same thing. So, what I taught you in uh, 3D I would like to teach you in different ways with the ultimate goal that you relate each of these uh, each of these and have a comprehensive understanding of brain anatomy. So, that is the purpose and uh, so how I would go about it is uh, I have finished on uh, modeling clay and the structure and what you need to keep in your mind. Now, I would jump a little bit into imaging, imaging for the simple reason that when you see imaging uh, that is how you most of you would be directly interacting with the uh, directly interacting with uh, uh, the brain. So, uh, the third part I would try to show you operative photographs, videos which which uh, which sort of give you a sense of how it actually looks like. So, that is the uh, that is the other idea. So, uh, pictures have their uh, relevance, uh, it is fairly easy nowadays to find atlases of the brain online and the very good atlases which I would invite you to go and uh, go and uh, go and under, uh, go and see. But uh, before you see I would request you that you go through this uh, at least the anatomy part of the story com completely because I have put the material in a fashion so that it may it may look uh, intimidating in the beginning. But uh, I hope that you would get a, a good understanding of the material by the time I am finished. So, uh, I restart my uh, class with uh, the manifold which is uh, which is what I would want you to remember because the next part of the discussion has a lot to lot more to do with the manifold. So, anterior and uh, posterior refers to the uh, front and back there are there is there is another nomenclature of supine and prone which basically refers to the position as such. So, please be familiar with these uh, terms, it may not be relevant here, but uh, uh, supine is face side, uh, prone is on the back side that is just about it. Anterior is front, posterior, medial towards the center, lateral away from the center and uh, superior is towards the head, inferior is uh, towards the leg. So, this, this is this is what you would need to uh, first understand. Now, uh, I proceed from there to an introduction on uh, brain imaging. So, I am not taking a separate class on uh, how to image the brain uh, because a uh, uh, lot of material goes out of context. So, here what I am trying to do is I am trying to explain uh, anatomy through imaging for which reason you need to know something about uh, brain imaging and then we proceed from there. So, uh, brain imaging a bit of historical aspects it is uh, you know. Uh, uh, the first idea that the brain has a structure is from uh, anatomical dissections 
and uh, you many of you would have understood that anatomical dissections were um, serious anatomical dissections and compilation. See people had been doing dissections uh, way before, but uh, uh, compiling the material to, uh, to atlases uh, and uh, writing textbooks on the stuff started along with the renaissance when, uh, when uh, people uh, you know uh, there, was, uh, there was this idea that the human body is dissectable had to be dissected to understand both its uh, structure and function. For nearly 4 centuries nothing much happened until we got x-rays by which you could actually um, see through the living human body. So, that was a uh, that was the uh, basis uh, or the first uh, step in imaging. So, most of us at some point of time in our lives uh, would have either seen or undergone an x-ray for various reasons. The commonest is place where x-rays are now used is in uh, dental work and uh, anybody who has undergone any kind of dental work would definitely have had an x-ray. Of course, x-rays are used for several other purposes, but the principles remain the same. Uh, uh, x-rays uh, go through the body and uh, give uh, two outputs in the image either it can be uh, opaque or translucent. So, opaque would become a white and uh, translucent would be a, a various shades of grey and black. So, uh, black would indicate air. Uh, fully white would indicate bone and this is the contrast by which you uh, which you interpret x-ray images. We are not about to discuss x-ray to any extent. Even in brain imaging x-rays played a fundamental role because x-rays uh, resulted in something called as a ventriculogram. So, uh, uh, the, the first, so these are the only two, uh, two differentiating features. So, you have got black and white and you have got air which acts as a contrast medium and so uh, how do you, uh, uh, how do you do that? You, you introduce air into the ventricles. I showed you about something about ventricles earlier in my classes and explained that ventricles contain CSF, normal part of brain anatomy, ventricles similar to the heart but in the uh, brain functions are completely different, they have no whatsoever relations excepting for the name. So, uh, you would put air into the ventricles and then uh, based on that you can infer several things. You can infer whether there is a tumor sitting which is distorting the ventricle, whether the ventricles are big, whether the ventricles are, uh, there is a shift. So, by which you could uh, do, do, do infer and maybe uh, treat uh, people. Now, the uh, next major uh, or the major uh, advancement is computer tomography. All of these are Nobel Prizes. Bas basically, imaging in the brain is a Nobel Prize. You do something good in the brain, you are guaranteed to get a Nobel Prize some 30 years down the line. So, uh, computer tomography, Hounsfield. Hounsfield, field, yeah, computer tomography. Basically, uh, you know, in, in uh, data science terms, it is a pretty logical uh, understanding that uh, somebody should have thought about it earlier than wait for nearly 50 years to get it done. But of course, I think data sciences were not very popular at that point of time. So, uh, in computer tomography, you have the same notion of uh, uh, x-rays, but uh, you do it in a circle. So, in a circle, you have the person sitting uh, in the uh, circle and uh, uh, in the circle and you have um, you have a source and a sensor situated on opposite side so you would have a, a uh, you would have a beam of x rays traversing to the person to the opposite side and then uh, you can move this thing across so you would you would you would get uh, you would get a tomography so that's the key term tomography tomography in the sense that you get points 
points on a circle where you get uh, density measurements of uh, this uh, x-rays and by which you reconstruct the uh, reconstruct the material. So, the algorithm which, which is used for reconstruction basically got the uh, Nobel Prize and uh, that is in very brief terms what a CT does. So, CT is basically extension of x-ray x-rays pass through the body across uh, across a curvature and uh, in the curvature you get the density values uh, collected on the opposite side and uh, based on the density values you infer what is the density in the center. So, that, that algorithm is uh, um, put on a gray scale is what a CT image is all about. But uh, there were there were there was a profound uh, difference. So, imaging changed with CT, CT changed the way in which we look at the human body and uh, that is uh, something which is which is which is remarkable in its own way. But uh, related uh, unrelated physics subject of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance NMR is what we call as magnetic resonance imaging. So, apparently nuclear was taboo even then and then that is why you got a very decent sounding name of magnetic resonance imaging. So, uh, so uh, it all, uh, the magnetic resonance imaging uses different principles it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it is based on the uh, spin of a hydrogen atom. So, uh, so you have two kinds of uh, spins of an hydrogen atom. You ensure uh, ensure that the entire hydrogen atoms are brought into alignment with a very big magnetic field. Then uh, this is uh, the big magnetic field B and this is the human hydrogen. Okay. So, human hydrogen uh, protons basically are brought into alignment with the uh, magnetic field. Then, uh, then you give a radio frequency pulse. Okay, so, radio frequency pulse uh, magnetic field you stop the magnetic field and then you see what happens to this. So, uh, what happens to the hydrogen uh, proton is that it goes back to its native uh, configuration. So, it is somewhat like this. And that process actually results in a uh, RF signal. So, the RF signal is picked by antennas and the image is reconstructed too simple an explanation. Okay. So, uh, where does the hydrogen come from? Hydrogen comes from water. Uh, most of us who are sitting at least for this class should be aware that we are, uh, con we, we contain a lot of water. Uh, I spoke to you about the importance of uh, ionic medium in everything starting from cell dynamics to cell uh, information transmission to transport, vesicles, everything, everything, everything there is in a uh, water medium. So, protons come from there. So, uh, so basically the proton forms the key entity. So, you find out the, find out the signal from every single hydrogen atom 
and uh, uh, by this method. So, you ensure that they all get uh, aligned in this particular uh, uh, magnetic field. So, it is it is from top to bottom and then uh, that would ensure that these uh, uh, atoms uh, come to a one single magnetic field and when you relax the switch off the field with a radio frequency, the radio frequency is taken up by the uh, hydrogen atoms and based on their original position when it comes back to the original position, uh, you get an output radio frequency, a uh, lot depends upon input radio frequency and uh, uh, input radio frequency and the nature of the tissue. So, so what are the uh, variables under consideration? You have a magnetic field. that is anywhere between uh, 0.2 tesla to 7 tesla, tesla has nothing to do with the car, it is the uh, magnetic field strength. Then you have radio frequency, so uh, there is uh, you can do a lot of stuff with the radio frequency, you can, uh, you can pulse it then you can uh, phase it and uh, you can you can uh, duration so uh, there are various uh, various methodologies adapted to change this uh, radio frequency again i am not an expert in any of this stuff i am just uh, conveying uh, it's interesting to note this stuff but uh, uh, you need to know these things as a basic stuff. So, you have a magnetic field, you have radio frequency and the uh, then you have got obviously antennas. Now, antennas are basically coils and they are placed in close proximity with the body part which is being uh, which is being imaged. Now, after that is uh, signal processing. and after that is image processing. Okay. We will analyze a little bit of this stuff before we actually go into the details. So, uh, small magnetic field to higher magnetic field. So, as the magnetic field increases, resolution increases, increase resolution. So, resolution is how fine you can differentiate, uh, okay, you can interpret between two closely placed structures and the larger the magnetic field, the better. So, why not 140 Teslas? So, <laughs> human beings we have been so far have been able to test only at up to 7 Teslas. Machines up to 14 Teslas I understand have been built, but they are not available for commercial uh, purposes. Generally, when you go to a hospital and get uh, most hospitals now have three Tesla machines, which is the which is the which is the same amount of Tesla which machines in our in the hospital where uh, in Nimhans where I work uh, have. So most of our machines are three Tesla. There are several nitty gritties. So uh, the um, uh, larger uh, the raj, larger the field. Um, larger is the machine uh, and uh, more cooling issues. So, cooling is for because they are um, uh, what is that term uh, for ensuring that you have superconducting magnets. Okay, so uh, so this is one of these applications in which you crack uh, uh, what is it superconducting at room temperatures. You would have a big breakthrough in MR technology. So larger the machine, basically it's the weight. So there are weight issues. Uh, you can't have very high magnetic fields in random locations. Say for example, hospitals. There are very interesting incidents in which uh, things have happened, uh, especially with the seven Tesla machines. Uh, even with the three Tesla machine, there is a lot of restriction on the uh, on the surroundings of a magnetic resonance uh, machine and it is uh, a big infrastructure to build, it is not very easy. So, that is something about uh, uh, magnetic field. So, the larger the magnetic field, the better the hydrogen ions, uh, protons 
get aligned to the magnetic field and that is the uh, that is the key for the uh, key of the issue. Radio frequency is the second part. So, you you insonate these protons with radio frequency, you, you give radio frequency to these protons, uh, they, they shift in the field and uh, they give back the radiation uh, radio frequency when they come back to orientation. So, that output radio frequency as I told you depends upon the input parameters of the radio frequency they are in terms of pulses. So, what is the duration of the pulse, what is the phase of a pulse. So, all these parameters I am not uh, again I am not an uh, expert we can do definitely go up and read up this stuff, but uh, do have an understanding it is the radio frequency parameters which are uh, which are the key to tuning the image. And um, as I understand these are not these are more like um, you know uh, the 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 uh, protocols have been developed and by consensus it is it, uh, the machine different machines uh, give you different uh, radio frequency settings and operator basically only uses uh, certain things it is like um, it's like having gears in a car you know you can have better transmission ratios in a car but you have only about 5 or 6 gears in a car which you can actually shift between so the radio frequency is like the uh, gear ratios, you do not have infinite gear ratios to run your car, you have got very fixed gear ratios which are based basically given by the manufacturer and similarly radio frequency settings are under the with the manufacturer, magnetic field is also with the manufacturer. So, antenna and coils there are a lot of developments happening in each of this space, so uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff happening in uh, 3D, uh, 3D coils. Uh, what is generally what I have understood is that you have uh, coils which are placed more closer to the region of interest, uh, you would have better imaging uh, acquisition and better images uh, as a consequence of that. So, uh, so that is about uh, something about uh, antennas. Now, the whole uh, data is, uh, is, uh, is in terms of um, is in terms of uh, voxels and then you you need to generate tomographic information. So, uh, tomographic information is um, you convert this uh, 3D uh, data which you have acquired through the radio frequency antenna and from that you uh, build grayscale images. So, somehow most of the uh, most of imaging has been very grey in colour. Uh, so, you know x-rays had only two colours and then the grey in between and CT by being a follower of x-ray also had grey. So, MR also has the tradition of being grey. So, you have a grey scale uh, by which uh, in which the tomographic information is being uh, represented and that is the uh, that is that is what is happening from the signals which are acquired from the radio frequency antenna. The radio frequency antenna takes in the radio frequency signals which are a function of the input radio frequency which goes when the patient is oriented in the magnetic field. So, that is that is that is what is happening. Image processing is the last part of the story. So, there are there are there are uh, you uh, what happens in MR is you interrogate a slice of tissue ok. So, uh, you interrogate a slice of tissue across the brain the methods by which you uh, met methods by brain and anything anything in the body. So, so, you interrogate tissue within that and then you interrogate another tissue uh, within the next slice. So, you have something like 2 slices and there are definitive multiple slices. So, you can have parameters such as slice thickness, time duration taken for the slice thickness, uh, how do you bridge the uh, bridge the gap between the slice uh, slices, how do you uh, interpolate data I think that is the correct term. So, there are gaps and you need to do interpolation. To, uh, to accommodate for the uh, data which is there between the two slices and uh, thicker the slice obviously lower the resolution. See rem remember this resolution is a very funny business, it is not just a single, um, uh, it is not a function of one single entity, it is a function of multiple entities. So, you have 
uh, field as uh, one of the issue, one of the uh, points, one of the one of the parameters which affect the resolution uh, magnetic field strength. So the larger the field strength, you get uh, the, this one. Even in radio frequency, there would be parameters which uh, change the amount of resolution. The slice thickness changes the amount of uh, resolution. Uh, there is another issue in slice thickness, uh, slice which is uh, which is how the tissue is interrogated. So, uh, so the uh, resolution of tissue is non-uniform. What I mean is, uh, in a slice, you have very good resolution, but in between slices, you have lesser resolution. Now, you please you can go read up this material in greater detail in a, uh, in some imaging textbooks, but uh, I would require you to remember that uh, slices, how the slicing is done, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, determines the overall picture resolution. Now, uh, the output uh, resolution of images with uh, MR images at around 0.6 mm. Now, you should remember that uh, when we speak about radio frequency waves or uh, um, this discrepancy is important to be understood. So, 6.6 .6 mm is our output resolution. Resolution. Practical. See, practical in the sense imaging. You, you get an image you ask for resolution greater than uh, meaning lesser than 0.6 mm it, it is not you do not get it. But if you look at uh, the dimensions of the other material say proton. So, proton basically if you are interrogating every single proton you are looking at um, you are looking at inter um, bond uh, level uh, stuff. I do not know what bond it is, but anyway, we are, we are we should be able to resolve between two closely placed hydrogen atoms. If we go by the theory that uh, MR technology is based upon protons, and all this stuff is because the individual protons move in a magnetic field with the radio frequency pulse. So, theoretical limit of magnetic resonance imaging should be the uh, space between uh, two hydrogen atoms, but that is completely out way beyond way, way beyond. So, this is one of the uh, one of the uh, limits. The other limit is between uh, is between slices. So, uh, in slice resolution is high in slice in slice resolution. So, in a given slice you can have very good very good resolution between two structures, but if we go look at inter slice this is poor. So, this poor business is one of the other things why you have this 0 0.6 mm and why you why you do not have why you do not have better than uh, 0 0.6 mm. Now, Mm, the other issue which would uh, which would actually influence is uh, motion. So, though we have theoretical limits of H plus H plus H plus. So, this is the theoretical resolution which you should have. But if there is motion between Two H plus, H plus, H plus, H plus. So, what would be the effective, uh, effective, effective resolution? So, you have something like this, you have something like this, and you have something like this. So, uh, so this, uh, this is how, this is how what happens with motion. Now, logic is you stop motion in the. Uh, stop motion and do that, which is why I do not know how many of you would have actually undergone an MR. So, what, what instructions are given is you have to remain perfectly still, perfectly still for how long?
that long. So uh, I, I, uh, you have to remain perfectly still for one to one and a half hours. So most of us uh, would find it difficult to remain perfectly still. See, perfectly still is 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 a very it's a loaded term. You know, you need, perfectly still is absolutely no movement in any part of your body for a duration of half an hour to one and a half hours. So, this perfectly is very, you know, you cannot even blink, you are not supposed to look to either direction, uh, any direction, you, you, okay, we close our eyes, uh, you keep your hands and uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, MR couch has restraints. Yeah, and it all it and it all looks quite rosy, but remember we are speaking of the uh, what kind of distances are we speaking of? We are speaking of distances between two hydrogen ions. Now, where does maximum movement happen with the body? Uh, it is with two very interesting uh, problems. One is uh, respiration. cardiac activity and in relation to cardiac activity the pressure wave. When we understand the phenomenon of blood pressure, all of us have heard uh, this term, it is a very common term. Uh, for known as a high blood pressure is a disease, low blood pressure is also a disease. Uh, so, what does the term blood pressure mean? Pressure means that the pressure of blood within the uh, within blood vessels, Bl blood vessels is both arteries plus uh, veins. Pressure pressure is needed for the flow of. Uh, it's basically equivalent to potential difference potential difference. So, potential difference is between heart and in for us we need to look at brain and also vice versa. So, you need to have negative, uh, so negative pressure here, negative pressure here and positive pressure here for the circulation to be maintained. But what it also means that uh, blood pressure is not a static uh, entity and uh, what you should look at is it is a pressure wave. The pressure wave which is generated in the heart moves across all these blood vessels. These blood vessels are not, uh, not uh, rigid pipes, they are, uh, they are flexible pipes. So, the wave goes across all every single blood vessel in the body. And if you remember earlier, I had spoken to you that the brain is richly supplied with blood vessels. So, what it means is that this pressure, this pressure wave, the small parts of the pressure wave impinge on various parts of the body. And basically, if you want somebody to be perfectly still, it is just not possible. So, you can, uh, so, so you should understand that the theoretical limits of MR cannot be realized, uh, the uh, theoretical resolution of MR imaging can never be realized in a live human being for the very simple reason you have got respiratory and cardiac activity. There are, there are, there are, there are things which they do and so that is the phenomenon, that is what is called gating. So, you have a respiration, a respiratory rate is about 14 to 16 per minute and uh, ca heart rate, cardiac rate is about uh, um, uh, 70 to 80 per minute and you can ensure that the signal is, uh, the RF signal can be synchronized to, uh, RF signal can be synchronized to these things and you have cardiac imaging uh, respiratory we do not because uh, air is a bad uh, medium for uh, mr imaging in general so um, so so i've i tried to explain a lot of the background in a very short duration of time each of these are research topics in themselves have a lot of scope opportunity to do 
So, people who are looking at MR imaging, they are MA, images and MA, images is fairly different from uh, from uh, MR imaging and that is what I have tried to highlight over here. So, MRI is about magnetic fields, radio frequency, the coils, uh, the signal processing which happens from the coils and then at the end of it is image processing. So, most uh, people who are working in fields are only working in the last part of a very predetermined sequence of events. You cannot, you do not have options to tune all of this stuff. So, MR, uh, so understanding brain structure function through imaging has this uh, caveats which are listed over here. So, the, uh, it is important to know that image processing is the last step of a very long series of um, long series of uh, data acquisition which is happening in the MI machine and you, you are you have very finite limits of tweaking signals uh, to do image processing and get meaningful outputs. So, please do remember this uh, stuff when we uh, when we when we uh, when we look at MI images and try to interpret that. Uh, so, there are limits to MI imaging and uh, another issue is as the uh, as the Tesla increases resolution actually sort of comes down. There are several other issues which creep up including heating and various other kinds of things which I am not going to speak now. So, uh, so far we have been looking at um, x-rays, x-rays, CT and MRI which are uh, which are which are the you know the benchmark uh, imaging uh, systems uh, CT and MRI are the most important uh, parts of the story. But there are several other kinds of uh, imaging modalities which you should know one is ultrasound. So, the problem is bone. So, I have shown you skull and how the skull covers all of the uh, brain and then it is not possible for the uh, brain to be insonated without tackling bone issues. So, ultrasound is popular intraoperatively. We use, I use, I use fair amount of ultrasound to uh, do locate at stuff which is within the head and uh, after taking out the skull. So, intra operative. There are multiple issues with ultrasound, ultrasound is generally not popular. Then you also got um, uh, what is that near uh, infrared, near, near infrared imaging, infrared infrared which also has uh, issues of poor resolution, but it allows you to find out some other things. So, that is the reason optical uh, optical computerized uh, tomography ok, o op optical ocular uh, oh no op uh, optical computerized tomography high resolution resolution I think I'm, I have problems with my spellings, but uh, poor um, what you call um, region of interest is very uh, low, depth of penetration of the OCT is very low. So, there are multitudes of imaging modalities which help you to have uh, ultrasound, there is also the advantage of Doppler I have not included. So, uh, the whole of this uh, uh, things is something called as uh, structural imaging. So, structural imaging is you see the structure without actually seeing something in action. And structural imaging is fair enough, decent enough for most medical stuff because it is not that we as physicians, surgeons do not like to uh, know the function, but you know when there is a limitation at least seeing the structure is far better than knowing uh, something dynamically. So, uh, for um, medical purposes each each investigation has a specific role. It is not that like I told ultrasound, ultrasound does not go to the skull, but when you take out the skull it is of use. 
So, uh, x-rays uh, we have uh, say you want to quick check the spine, you know spinal cord integrity can be quickly checked with x-rays. CT is the standard for traumatic uh, um, diseases, you know somebody has an accident, uh, CT acquisition time is, in, uh, is mostly under a minute. So, under a minute you can get a CT and so that is very fast to find out life threatening problems. MR takes about 30, 40 minutes at the uh, at the minimum. So, it is not a very popular uh, idea. A CT is also useful for stroke in which uh, the golden hour principle exists and you have to do, you have to identify and act upon things. MR gives you better resolution, MR is gives you a lot of very fine details which we will be seeing subsequently, but uh, it has its uh, limitations in terms of time, availability, infrastructure required and so many other issues. NIR is upcoming technology for very niche areas such as uh, trauma, head injury evaluation and things like that. OCT is specific for mostly lab kind of stuff, we have not had very good, um, I cannot re recollect things in which it is useful for uh, in the operative setting which is the only place where you can actually see brain at uh, close, uh, uh, close proximity. Brief mention of Raman also, so uh, Raman spectroscopy is also uh, in has some uh, relevance in uh, brain imaging and uh, diagnosis. But uh, Raman, if people do know Raman, the, the equipment is so big that you cannot take it into theatres. So, that is about, uh, that's about uh, structural imaging. So, when uh, functional imaging or Functional imaging is evaluation of function. See, uh, the engineering notion of function is pretty different from our notion of function, evaluation of function. Okay, so, functional imaging, uh, there are uh, several modalities. So, MRI, we have um, fMRI, then um, yeah, so uh, diffusion actually is not, yeah, diffusion sort of uh, gives an idea of function and perfusion. Okay, so these are, these are the general idea by which you can, have, you have some, some notion of the function of the brain. Then you have uh, positron emission tomography you have SPECT single proton uh, emission computerized tomography. Uh, in ultrasound you have Doppler. So, these are, uh, these are, uh, the PET is based upon uh, nuclear um, nuclear tagging. So, there are various kinds, the most popular is glucose. In my class on glycolysis, I have highlighted uh, glycolysis and the power systems of the brain. I have highlighted how, how glucose is utilized um, for, the, uh, for the complete uh, structural integrity of the brain and uh, uh, signal transmission, signal processing, everything. A lot of it uh, is energy dependent and glucose is used to process. So, uh, when you tag uh, with uh, radioactive glucose, you find out the areas where increased uptake of glucose is available and then you build inferences out of it. Uh, single positron uh, emission, positron emission tomography is again uh, based on positron detection uh, and uh, you do get uh, low resolution tomographic images. Uh, sort of uh, reflex perfusion and fMRI and uh, this one. Doppler gives you only blood flow in blood vessels. So, these are methods by which you interrogate the uh, brain. So, this is, a, this is a very brief summary of the uh, stuff which happens within the uh, imaging uh, side. Many of you would be interested in this uh, topic for which reason I thought I should introduce a capsule. It is also necessary for me to 
for me to explain the next part of the story which is anatomy of brain in imaging. So, most of you would not in any part of their career both academic and in their work uh, have the necessity of seeing uh, brain uh, either live or as uh, the cadaver brain. So, work would be dependent on images which you get and images from live people are basically MR, CT, uh, rarely ultrasound. So, PET and SPECT of course. So, uh, it is necessary that you understand how these images are generated before actually seeing the images and I need to put the context proper before I go into the imaging part of the story. Okay, we will stop here and then we will continue into the next uh, session. Okay, thank you. <laughs>